Hello and welcome everyone to our talk about survivor testimony. Hannah's kindly agreed to be interviewed for our Holocaust and Genocide module for the third year undergraduate history students at Nottingham Trent University. Um, while remote learning may seem really strange to us still, there are positives to hold on to. And one of these is being able to, uh, to invite Hannah into the classroom. We thought it would be a good um, good for students to speak with Hannah, um, albeit virtually and through us putting, you know, your questions to her, um, because we want students to understand the importance of testimony for historians and how to conduct interviews with survivors. Um, as we mentioned to you earlier, um, before the talk, Hannah, students have been learning about the differences between history and memory, the definitions of the Holocaust, kinder transport, genocide, the rise of the Nazi state, Kristallnacht, war and genocide and, and comparisons around that, the current refugee crisis, um, the transnational history of the kinder transport, and as well as memory of the kinder transport. Today, then, we're going to be well, we're going to try and, and speak about all these different to topics. So um, hopefully we'll be able to speak about the following themes, such as how testimony develops over time, testimony and its links to memory theories, different ways we remember, whether a survivor story confirms or challenges a national memory, personal transnational memory, complexities around testimony, um, effects of the Holocaust and then the last one is kind of how testimony is used um, but before we introduce Hannah to the students and we, we go through their questions I want to invite Bill um, to speak about the importance of testimony for academics so um, Bill would you like to tell us what testimony is? Well that's a, that's a, a big question but um, I think testimony well, I mean, we know we have different ways of remembering the past. Um, we remember through commemoration. We remember through memorials. We remember through museums, um, and many other different ways, even films and literature, are all parts of memory. But the only kind of direct window we have on the past is through survivor testimony, um, where survivors talk about their experiences um, at the time and subsequently. And this is the, as I say, the only direct window we have, and that's why it's so important. And it's also the reason that when we go to Holocaust centers today, we don't just see exhibitions. We, if we're lucky anyway, let get to hear survivors. We see survivor testimony, we hear survivor testimony in museums and exhibitions. Uh, survivors also talk at commemorative ceremonies uh, about their experiences. So they're central to the way we remember the past. And I think without them, we would be at a big loss. But sadly, it's true that many survivors are no longer with us, especially um, Holocaust survivors. Uh, we can still, however, listen to their testimony in the form of videos or on YouTube, for instance. Um, and more and more, of course, uh, the Holocaust Center at um, Holocaust, um, Center at uh, Nottingham, near Nottingham, for instance, has been developing a project whereby testimony can be recorded virtually and also the survivor can be with us in a kind of hologram, hologram format. So there are attempts to try to create a semblance of reality. Um, I think though the time is probably coming soon when we will have to rely a lot more on what's called cultural memory. And since the, the course that Amy's talking about has to do with differences between memory, I'll try and address this quickly. So communicative memory is the memory that's passed down from the survivor generation to subsequent generations. It's generally seen as running through three or four generations, according to the Asmans. Um, and then once the last generation is no longer with us, um, it is replaced by cultural memory. And cultural memory would take the form, as I said, of museums or exhibitions, but also film and literature. So any uh, cultural form that's out there, which transmits a memory of an event would be, would be called cultural memory. It's also the case, of course, that if we record survivors' testimony, then that also becomes a form of cultural memory because it's recorded at a particular time in the past. The questions usually reflect society as it was at that time. So even the recording of testimony is a, a form of cultural memory, I think. Um, uh, now, as Amy, I think, was, we might also come to talk, to talk about later, uh, memory in in a society is influenced by not just the way it's passed down 
aspects of communicative and cultural memory, but also by national paradigms. So there is a tendency amongst Holocaust scholars and memory scholars to be aware of the fact that memory is not something pure, that it's very often shaped by the national interests of a particular country, that we want to remember a particular way because it suits uh, our nation to remember. In the case of Britain, we have a very positive memory of the war, Second World War, and I think we like to remember what we achieved by way of, of defending um, humanity during that war. Uh, Germany has a very self-critical memory of its role in the war as the perpetrator country. So national memories are different and accordingly uh, awareness of the Holocaust uh, can be different. Um, but I think that things have changed over the last 20 years and particularly since the, the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust in 2000 and then again the International Holocaust Remem uh, Remembrance Alliance from 2008, 2008 I think and some 35 countries have signed up to this I mean European and non-European and from this we can see that the memory of the Holocaust is no longer something that's nationally compartmentalized but it's really taking, uh, um, is spreading out over many, many different countries. Many different countries are collaborating, are working together in their remembering of the Holocaust. So it's true, I think, to speak of a transnational memory of the Holocaust, and that's something we might remember, uh, or might, uh, might come to a little later. Um, I'm not saying that transnational memory has been replaced by national memory. I mean, Holo Holocaust uh, memory scholars tend to be a bit skeptical about whether this, this has actually happened. It's perhaps more the case that transnational memory and national memory undergo a kind of synthesis, and which might be different in the case of each uh, country we might be discussing. Uh, transnational memory, though, is not just something that happens at the level of nations or groups. It can also happen at the level of an individual. And I think one thing that Amy examined in her thesis was the degree to which uh, a survivor of, 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 say, of the kinder transport in this case can have a memory of the past that is inherently transnational, especially if this person has traveled across different borders during the period of persecution um, or threat, and also subsequently after 1945, if they were still moving around then. So their experience was fundamentally transnational. And their memory of it may be too, in, in that they don't always tell linear stories, but sometimes move from one memory in one country to another memory in another country, because memory can operate associatively, and by doing so can also move across borders. And um, I, I don't, don't know if I'm saying anything untrue about your thesis, Amy, but I think it, it did look particularly um, at personal transnational memory. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks, Bill, for such a great start and, and a really informative start as well. Uh, to an introduction of testimony. So um, as the students know, we've been learning about you know, so many different memory theories and, and Bill provided the lecture on this. Um, we've looked at national memory, we've looked at multi-directional memory, cosmopolitan memory, post-memory, communicative and cultural memory, which Bill has just uh, you know, gone over again for us. And now, as Bill mentions, we're focusing on personal memory this week. Um, this is the final week that I have with the students and what a way to finish with, you know, with Hannah's story um, and a, such a meaningful week as well with the anniversary of Crystal Knack um, tomorrow. Um, so now, I, now, as Bill said, it, in terms of my thesis, we're gonna look, start looking at personal transnational memory. So what do I mean by that? Well. Um, I mean exactly what Bill, Bill said. Um, it's a memory which moves across borders, but kinder not only remember or recall their movements to different places, they also draw ethical conclusions from their experiences. And we'll, we'll talk about this, um, hopefully towards the end of the talk. Um, the emergence of these personal transnational memories might make it harder, perhaps even impossible for us to ignore the negative aspects of the kinder transport. We talked about those last week. The more extensive the process of, of, of uprooting, the greater the suffering of the kinder. Regardless of what country the kinder journeyed to, many autobiographies, as, as Hannah's you'll see, do not present the kinder transport as a movement from threat to safety, but as an ongoing process of rupture and removal from familiar settings. Um, we also talked about briefly last week how kinder transport memory in general has developed over time and how Britain's national narrative has, has really crystallised. Um, in a, in a positive way, it, that is starting to be challenged as, as we saw last week. But as we were talking also last week, we looked at how the first edited volumes around testimony of the kinder transport in the 60s were quite critical. Um, but then memory moved in a more positive direction as academics 
came to uh, to study the topic but this was also during a time of reunion and, and people were reconnecting with people after so many years and we've sort of seen a shift within the next within the following uh five ten years in a more critical direction and bill i don't know if you want to talk to that yeah well the question is i suppose why um and i think uh testimony maybe that the, the movement towards a more critical um memory may have to do with the individual survivors themselves that the older they they get the more critical critical they become in taking stock of the past it may as you say amy have to do with the reunions and the discussions that took place during those reunions but i think it also has to do and i don't know maybe hannah wants to, to speak to this that there is a sort of sense that although we've learned a lot from the past we've not learned enough Mm -hmm. uh, and what we see around us today, we just need to think of the example of, of, of Syria, which has been going on now for a long, long time, but that's only one country of many that's affected by civil war, um, ethnic cleansing and genocide is still with us. Uh, and so that might encourage us to look at the past more critically and at the present and the future as well. Absolutely. So for the students, we're going to be talking about this in, in seminars again. Um, and again, that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of, of the importance of testimony. So we're now going to move on to, to the questions that you've all been you know, wanting to ask Hannah. And before I do, I just want to briefly show you Hannah's autobiography. This is the English um, publication and this is the German um, publication here. Um, so... Okay, so now I'd like to introduce Hannah to all of the students who I'm sure will be watching and um, are very excited to talk about um, this in seminars with us. Um, Hannah, it's lovely to see you. Um, and I know the students are looking forward to hearing the, your answers to their questions. But before we ask you their questions, I wonder if you could um, introduce yourself and your story for us, please. Um. Amy and Bill, it's really uh, very special for me to be here. And I think uh, you've already referred uh, to tomorrow being the anniversary of Kristallnacht. And so I'm sensing uh, the significance of our time together today, because in some ways, uh, Kristallnacht was the catalyst that um, got the kingdom transport moving, you know, that the, uh, the rescue operation really got a big push uh, from the kinder transport. And uh, it's very good um, in this uh, sense of memory to recognize the significant dates that we, um, uh, as part of our memorial. Um, I could just give you a brief, uh, briefest introduction to the story of um, really my journeys. I think, uh, you know, kinder transport is a journey. So I think journey is a good title <laughs> for my um, overview of my life. Uh, I was born 11 months before Hitler took control of Germany. My parents were both Jewish. I was an only child and we lived in Gmünd, um, a small spa town west of Cologne near the Belgian border. And uh, we lived on the main street. My father had a household shop and he was also an antique dealer. And there were, we were part of an active Jewish community and it was all centered around the synagogue. So, um, Kristallnacht, when the synagogue was burnt and ransacked, was the most traumatic event for our little community. And um, I think um, that was when my father uh, got the idea to find me a place. We were uh, moved to Cologne, the big city on our east, um, and I, you know, I rather think we were forced to go, although I'm not sure. And um, it was from Cologne that the train left uh, for England. And um, I never saw my parents again. I was accepted by a foster family in Coventry, 
which was really like uh, jumping from the frying pan into the fire because on the 14th of November 1940, uh, Coventry was bombed in the Blitz. I now live in Phoenix, Arizona, and there have been many, many adventures between 1932 and the present. And I would summarize the years of my adult life in the title I gave, Journeys. There was the physical journey from England to Europe, to worldwide travels, marrying an American, now living in, in Arizona, but I've often traveled back to Germany, Germany. So I've kind of been on the moon. But also, I think uh, even more significant is the inner journey. In my 20s, I began to engage with my losses, the loss of my parents, my culture, my identity. And I began to face the bitterness that I had towards those who had unjustly murdered my parents, my family, and my people. And um, I found forgiveness through a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. And in that um, event, it was like opening a door to being able to be willing to face the past because really up to then in my mid twenties, I had blocked out the past. I hadn't been able to deal with it. And finally, uh, the books that um, Amy showed are part of my healing journey, the process of really sitting with my past and entering into it for the sake of writing um, that was really a significant part of my ability to be freed uh, from the bondage of, of the past. Oh, thanks so much Hannah for your introduction. It, you're always so eloquent with your answers as well and I think it really is a privilege for us all and I'm sure the students will agree um, to listen to you today and, and thanks ever so much for so movingly you know doing a whistle stop tour of, of your life really it was it, it's incredible to hear your story and you know the students will be able to, to read your book as well um, uh, as the as the course goes on but yeah to, to, to really jump into their questions then um, and this really just just touch on what you said then um, so one of the students wants to know, when did your parents realize that they had to send you abroad? Um, you know, I, I just feel that the questions were very uh, deep and significant. You know, together, I just sense how deeply uh, all you students have been engaging with the issue of memory. And, you know, in answering you, uh, and having listened to Bill so um, um, clearly defining uh, memory in relation to the Holocaust and now the kinder transport, um, I'm also aware that the survivor's memory uh, is very personal. And you know, one of the things in writing the book, I really wanted to know the truth and the reality of what happened. But I was also very aware that we each bring to the memory our own um, uh, character and uh, personality and view of things. And so um, I would really like to preface what I say in answer by that is the best and most honest answer I can give but please filter it through the fact that here is this one survivor, one of 10,000 kinder transport children. That's, that's my view, you know. Um, so the question was, um, in relation to how I um, felt about things, and you know, having given that, a proviso about the limits of personal memory. Uh, there's also the limitation in the kinder transport of the age. 
And I'm very aware that at the age of seven, I had a very limited experience of life. Um, I think my parents protected me from anti-Semitism, but it kept intruding. Mm. And I think also that they were very afraid. You know, there were some incidents in life that showed their great fear. And, you know, children pick up the emotions of the parents very closely, although it's unspoken, it's this emotion that you connect with. And um, I think um, my memories are very limited to give you a very clear answer to that question. No, thank, thank when you. did my parents realize? Were you aware of the seriousness of this situation? So yes and no. I don't know when my parents realized. I think it was Crystal Knock. So. And, and like you were saying, it, it's so significant for the anniversary tomorrow as well. And hopefully we can come back to that point in, in the summary of, of this talk. Um, another student wanted to talk about, um, and that you, you've kind of spoke to this already, but I'll, I'll ask it again nonetheless. Were you aware of the, the seriousness of the situation? Um, I really um, um, respect this question because the student is trying to get into what, what was actually going on inside. And I, I would sum it up with the word trauma. Um, I was filled with fear and anxiety. Um, I was trying to cope with the loss of everything that was familiar and all security. My parents had been my security. I didn't have brothers and sisters. I was an only child and I was thrust, unprepared, um, lacking the ability to cope. So that, that was um, significant trauma. And I think one of the issues at that time was, I don't think there was an awareness and there wasn't a capacity to help because it was such a rushed operation and people weren't prepared. They were doing the best they could, those people who were involved in the rescue. But as far as the emotional state of the children, that was um, really uh, not addressed. And also, um, I was coming from a Jewish, emotional, close, loving, demonstrative um, family into a British, uh, a stiff upper lip, you know, and uh, what a lucky girl you are. So that was a really traumatic situation. I remember lying in bed, um, it must have been just days after arriving in, in England, uh, very anxious because I thought I would forget all my German and I was not with anyone who understood German and I feared that I would not uh, know any English and here I would be uh, not able to communicate to anyone in the whole wide world. So that's a child's, um, you know, anxiety uh, without being able to express it. Absolutely. And what then you know you, you've briefly spoken about your your time in coventry another student wants to know what were your first thoughts when you arrived in britain um it was very strange i think i clung to the other uh, children we were in a group who did not have anything lined up for us there were no people waiting for us and there were about six of us and we traveled together by train and um the first family i uh was uh, fostered into uh, was very kind and they had a little boy my age which was really very very um helpful for me because it was just very friendly and i felt rather safe with him and that, and that really speaks to the next question, really. D did you feel safe in, in Britain? Um, you know, um, actually, to be honest, I think I felt somewhat unsafe. 
because my safety had been my parents. There was uh, the feeling of uh, danger all around us in, in Germany before I left. Um, I think, you know, studying the history, I realized from the time that Hitler came to power, there were uh, laws passed against Jews, and it wasn't just a final Kristallnacht moment when there was this traumatic event. Uh, we must have lived under um, oppressive measures and um, being outsiders. And then I remember different events that proved that. That was unsafe, but really, as a child, your safety is your parents. And um, that had been taken away. So physically, I was actually cared for. I was fed. You know, we were warm. You know, everything was provided. But emotionally, I felt unsafe. And another student wants to know, did you feel welcomed by those in Britain? I think... Um, Yes and no, you know, um, we're talking about not only the initial arrival, but the um, going into the months as the war began. I think that uh, when war was declared, there was great fear in Britain. Britain, we were uh, expected to be invaded. And there were such warnings about fifth column and uh, spies among us. The fact that I was uh, German, I was Jewish, yes, but I was also German. There was a little unease with that, you know. The family that I uh, lived with changed my name. My name on my birth certificate was Johanna. And at home I was called Hannah Laura because my middle name was Flora, but Hannah Laura was a common German name. And they felt, I think, that it was too foreign. So I was called Hannah. And so you see, that was almost like an invasion of my identity. So I, I would say the answer is yes and no. <laughs> yeah. And another, another student wants to know, um, and again, you've, you've sort of spoken to this point already, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. Did you feel, or did you fully understand what was happening around you at the time? Um, it was with very limited understanding. Um, and I think I was an agent in the not understanding. I was a participant in a blocking out. You see, that was, how do children deal with trauma? How do many adults deal with trauma? Uh, you uh, avoid it, you um, suppress it, you deny it. And so I uh, buried um, what was really at my heart deep down, and I engaged with the present. Mm, absolutely and I know that, that you know that your whole message as well really speaks to that point that you've just made but before we we come back to that I, I'm going to carry on with the students question but that that um what you've just said really goes back to your message of forgiveness and and bringing people together but um yeah another student wanted to to know um what do you remember or you know what what was it like to journey on the kinder transport? They also want to know if, um, again, you understood what was happening when you arrived in Coventry. Yes, yeah, some of, one or two of the questions have links, don't yeah. they? <laughs> um, what do I remember? You know, I'm very interested in reading other uh, kinder transport children's um, memories because I learn a lot about what happened because um, there are certain memories. Some big memory was saying goodbye to my parents. 
um, the last view of them on the steps of the train looking uh, because I had been told it would be a nice journey and I had not been warned about the losses. So that was the moment the truth dawned. But my memory is of the train and it was full of children. And that was a bit um, difficult to uh, feel comfortable in. And many of the children were running up and down the corridor, uh, jumping and shouting. And while I was buried into myself in a corner of the carriage, and I remember a Red Cross worker coming and telling the children to be quiet and sit and pointing me out as a good little girl. But I wasn't a good little girl. I, that was how I dealt with it, you know. I, I couldn't um, cope with it, so I buried myself. So that was one memory. Another memory is also of trauma when we were told to identify our luggage. And that was when we went from the train, I think, to the ship. And I, I, I couldn't do it. And I remember standing in the middle of this big shed with all these, these luggage crying. And a Belgian, um, he must have been um, a worker with the railways or the shipping, uh, coming and helping me. And I had a label around my neck with my number on and I think the number must have been on the luggage and he connected the two and helping me. Wow. Um, somebody else wants to talk about, um, did you feel any hope of surviving? And if so, what provided this and, and did you hold on to it? Um, I think, you know, that's a very, penetrating question and my response is this you know I think our first seven years of life are very significant in our emotional development and you know my parents were older I was an early child and I was the light of their life in many ways I was very spoiled but I experienced intense security in their love so I think that was a gift they gave me that really helped me uh, to survive and to uh, make that internal decision to keep going, not to give up. So I think that was this strong foundation. Now, that is one aspect, but now I'm 88 now, and looking back, I really believe that I have a heavenly father and that, you know, there have been so many experiences in my life that I just feel his protection of me. Absolutely. It, it's a wonderful message that you have. And, and it will, the last question, I'm sure you'll be able to speak to that more. Um, another student wants to, to ask you, do you forgive the people who um, had such a terrible impact on your life? And that were responsible for the Holocaust? If so, what does that feeling of being willing to forgive them come from? And um, just get speaking as well to that point, did you always feel that way, willing to forgive? You know, I marvel at the depth of understanding and interaction uh, of the student who asked that question with um, the deeper elements um, of the kinder transport. Because, uh, you know, for me, uh, the whole issue of forgiveness is the key. Um, and I think there's another question about the life afterwards. How, how can I live? And, um, I just feel that was, you know, we talked about journeys, but there's also crossroads in our journey. And I think uh, my inability to forgive, first of all, in the first part of my life, up to my early 20s, uh, brought me uh, to a kind of desperation because um, 
the, the cruelty, the injustice and the loss and the snuffing out of my parents' lives, my aunts' lives, and then all oh, my little best friend's life, and then the six million, which is, you can't really conceive of that. Um, you know, I was so filled uh, with bitterness and um, hatred for people who had done this. And, you know, uh, the con and, you know, this whole thing of Germany as the enemy was really fostered uh, during those war years. And, I mean, look at the cartoons and um, the words. So that said all that that was in me. But, you know, I think when you have a lot of hatred and you um, have this anger and bitterness, um, it doesn't really affect the people that you're angry with or hate. It really uh, damages you. And so for me, this was um, all turning inside. While uh, on the outside, I tried to be an English, a nice English girl, you know, nice. But um, every now and then, what was inside would just burst out at inconvenient moments, which I could not control. But really, uh, if I was honest with myself, I didn't like the kind of person I was. And you see, that's what drove me to um, see that I needed help. And the help that came to me was when I heard that Jesus could take all that pain, anger, hatred that was going on inside me. I could gather it together and give it to him. And that's why he died. And um, that was the beginning of freedom. I would say that was the beginning of my forgiveness journey because I experienced that in Horsham, England, where I was a teacher. And that was a long way uh, from Gmund in the Eiffel where it all happened. But that was the beginning, the first step. And the further traveling led me to actually go back to those places absolutely and, and you you touched upon um somebody else's question and i'll just read out to you now um do you feel you live your life differently because of your experience with the kinder transport absolutely you know i wonder what would have happened um i kind of have these I don't know if it's true, but I have this idea. My father wanted the best education and he was going to send me to Switzerland and all those things. And I was a very um, self-absorbed, selfish child. And um, I would never want what happened to me to happen to anyone. But it, it's very interesting how something so awful um, I can now um, see some sparks of light in it all. And um, I think um, somehow the word redeem, I think the losses have been redeemed because I feel my life has been very blessed. I'm very thankful for so many things. Uh, my husband, my friends, and the experiences I've been able to have. And I think the greatest satisfaction has been to actually uh, relate to people whose ancestors were part of the perpetrators and to, um, to say that I forgive you. And this kind of really goes on to, to this person's, um, the student, sorry. Um, next question, do you think history will repeat itself and or something like this could happen again, or do you think it already has? Um, I think Bill referred to Syria, and I think it's it's been going on. Think about um, the Rohingya in Burma, and think about the Uyghurs in China. You know, think about all those the gulags in Russia. 
And um, think about some of the children that were separated from immigrant parents in America and they, they still haven't found the connection. They haven't found the parents. Um, there is something um, dark in, um, in all our hearts that needs uh, healing. Absolutely. And this is our final question um, from the students before we move on to something else. But the last message, um, sorry, the last question is, um, do you have a message for the future? Yes, um, I, um, I am so happy uh, that you're doing this course. I think this is the message for the future because here we are, students who are engaging with what happened in one incident of um, persecution. So my message is um, take care to um, respect uh, each other. Those who are different, uh, receive them. You know, we are all um, children of God. We are all humans. And um, so my message is um, let's um, take care of our hearts. You know, um, it starts really in our own personal hearts. And, you know, these uh, massive uh, international and national uh, wrongs, we can have microcosms of them in our family and in our friendships and in our associations. So my message is um, tend, tend your heart, each of us. And I say that to myself. Oh, thanks ever so much, Hannah, for answering all the students' questions. Um, as we, as this is a, you know, a continuous talk really from, we, the students would have listened to our previous YouTube um, clips. That's what the kind of work I set them um, ahead of their, of their seminars. So um, now's kind of the opportunity for us really to carry on the conversation and maybe to make some summary points from what the students have, have been discussing in class. And I wondered um, just before we build, bring Bill in, you know, what, what is what does all this mean to you on a, on a personal level you know you, you've previously spoken to um a primary school up in liverpool and you're now speaking with us at a university level at um in nottingham you know what do all these virtual meetings mean to you um you know i'm a little bit um astonished because here I am at 88 years old, you know, I used to kind of travel to Germany and talk to different groups. And we're closed in, all of us, with this coronavirus. And we're living in most amazing times when we are communicating across continents. And we can have heart to heart talks, face to face. So I think that. Um, I'm also amazed that at the age of 88, and I think sometimes when you're 88, I'm thinking about memory and sharpness of mind and everything, but um, it's like this huge door has opened, and the fact that we can record this, you know, Bill was talking about how um, shortly we will not have any living witnesses to the Holocaust or to the kind of transport. Yet we have, you know, I feel as though I'm part of history in talking with you. And so I'm a bit awed by the, um, the significance of that, that the things we're saying today, other people will be able to hear years from now. And it is a message of warning, but also a message of encouragement. Mm. And Bill, I don't know if you want to be brought in here and, and kind of summarise what, what's just happened, really. And, and you know, I, we've got a couple other questions, if that's OK, Hannah, to put to you in terms of just what me and Bill have been talking about and how, you know, how the um, sessions have been running these last five weeks. So I don't know if, Bill, you want to 
chime in first? <laughs> uh, well, I think thanks very much, Hannah, for, for answering the questions and taking the time to do that. And question, the answers were fascinating. And I think the one thing that struck me and makes thinking about why testimony is important um, and what struck me about what you were saying is that there are things that I just would never think of. I mean, you know, I can read a history book, but I would have no sense of what you've just said in many ways. For instance, you talked about how you arrived in England and you had this fear of losing your language, losing your German language and not being able to communicate. And at the same time, in, in the environment in which you were in Britain, you didn't speak any English. So that you would effectively be voiceless, be speechless. Um, so it, in a sense, you were free from the persecution in Germany, but at the same time, you had no voice. And that's something that, that came through very clearly in what you said. And I don't think I would have seen that so clearly from just reading a history book. That's something that comes through through personal testimony. And what also struck me was what you said about, we think of the kind of transport as a move from threat to safety. That's how it's conventionally represented, isn't it, isn't it, Amy? And you've, you've shown how, it, well, it was that, but at the same time, it was a move from a, from a physical, physically threatening environment to an environment that was physically safe, but one that was emotionally lacking because you left your parents behind and your parents provided a closeness to you, which when you got to Britain, you totally lost. And so it, it's also a move from, it's a move from threat to safety in one way and from safety to loss in another. And, and that's yeah. again, I think it's not something I could have seen so clearly without what you said today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and Hannah, just to, to carry on the conversation and Bill and I wanted to put some questions to you. And, and one of them is kind of, I suppose, what does testimony mean to you? I think, um, testimony uh, has a variety of meanings. One thing is, I, I, it makes me aware, you know, to show my own testimony, how much, uh, how important it is to be heard. Mm. I think one of the things that has been an enormous uh, joy to me in these exchanges that we've had, the three of us and the two of us, um, is that you listen and you reflect on what I've said, you know, like Bill just um, summarized uh, some insights on what that um, does to a person. It kind of authenticates who they are as a person and it gives meaning uh, to their lives. And, you know, that makes me reflect about listening to other people. You know, in a way, we all have stories. Mm. You know, um, kind of uh, the kinder transport is, is unique in one sense, but everybody has their story. And, you know, when you ask me that question, it inspires me to want um, to encourage other people to share their stories with me. I would like to also be a person who appreciates um, and authenticates another person's life. Mm. Absolutely. And I suppose going on from that question, why is testimony important to you then? To me? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, there is this element of um, a warning. In my particular um, story is a warning. You know, we all have different um, um, significance to our life stories but because we've talked about um, the world and world history um, and I you know I find um, it's very important for me not to have the identity of a victim in my testimony because I am not a victim I have um, experienced uh, a healing of the past and so that is also a part of the message that I would like to give. And also uh, I would like uh, my message to be that 
my only identity is not a kinder transport survivor. You know, when we experience that healing, it makes a, a fuller, richer life. And I think um, for a joyful, um, fulfilling life, we need um, to have a wider identity. So that's all part of the message that I would like to bring. So I feel that um, giving testimony, I want to uh, serve others in their lives and to enrich their lives. It, it needs to have a purpose uh, beyond uh, just uh, for me, you know, my self-expression. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I can't thank you enough for all the, the exchanges we've had and how much you really helped me with my thesis and going forward, Bill and I, with that, with the book that we're doing. And I suppose that leads on to my next question. You know, we've both had the privilege of one, reading your book and then two, you know, speaking and having so many lovely conversations with you and really meaningful exchanges. But for the students that haven't all read your book at the moment, I suppose for them, I'd really like you to talk about, if, if you don't mind, how you put your own testimony together. Yes, um, um, I was a reluctant writer. You know, you're hearing me today um, after a, a long journey through um, denial and resistance. I was a resistant person to telling my story, but this is the exquisite um, way of um, the way it's fallen out. Uh, it was a German who got me over the hump you know isn't that lovely you know and um so and i've got, lost my train of thought what was it you were asking me oh sorry how you put your own testimony together okay yeah well one of the things uh, was uh, to actually go back to the places uh, where things happened you know, um, my husband and I went back to Gemund. We went back to Cologne. We actually um, went to the place where we lived in Cologne. We went to where my parents uh, were gassed. And we went to the forest where their bodies were burned. And we went to the river where the ashes were dumped. So. For me to actually go to the places where it happened, it was very um, tough, it was hard, but also I often in those journeys was either with my husband or with friends who helped me. So one of the things I felt was God's blessing in doing that. And you know, if I took the step, although it seemed such a, an impossible thing emotionally, it was like I was met by all the help possible. And there were often little incidents, so I recorded those. You know, I felt my book was my um, kind of journal of my life, the past and what was happening now. So I, it was this um, experience of healing those events by going there and feeling the feelings I'd never felt before, and then writing about it. And writing is quite um, a release. It was like, it was tough, it was hard, and it was hard to find the words and how to edit it and arrange it. But the exercise was enormously beneficial. And it, and it, it, it shows, and for all the students that haven't finished Hannah's book, it, it's it's amazing. It, it really is an incredible read, and I've I've told them about um, you know, the YouTube clips that where you're you are discussing your book as well, and I think they'll they'll be reflecting upon that in class as well. Um, you you've talked about your your travels and your journeys back to Germany, and again for the for the students that haven't yet finished your book, could you please tell us how you researched your own story? Well, you know, um, nowadays you just go to Google and you just get everything. <laughs> but when I was writing the book, 
that just wasn't available mm -hmm. and it was very arduous and I would um it was like I went from one thing to the next mm -hmm. and um I would get as many books as I could about um the events you know whether it was history or survivors testimonies i uh, one example is that i read about this um movie uh, on cha on um what's it called um that it talked about chelmno and it's eight hours long um show up by lanceman Yes. Show up. Yes. Show up. Show up. Yeah. Mm. Um, you see, I, I wanted to enter into what was happening to my parents, and so we got the movie, and you know, it starts off with this man who actually is a survivor of Chamo, where my parents perished. There were very few, just a handful, but I couldn't take it. You know, it was just too terrible and so I discovered um, a little booklet that had all the dialogue and so I read the booklet I could do that you know the, the movie was too vivid and so that's um, without having Google I discovered these things like this little booklet of the whole dialogue of Shoah and so I went over it and I read it. And as I read it, I experienced, you know, my parents' experience. You know, the testimonies of um, truck drivers who um, fixed the gas into the truck with all maybe 60 Jewish lives packed together and all that and i went into it and that's how i wrote the book mm, thanks ever so much hannah for sharing that with us um i've just got two more questions and then kind of a, a summary i suppose um again we've you know we've had a, a real special relationship build over the years and it's lovely to see that you know your relationships with lots of other people and, and you know the school that I spoke about um that you've recently spoken to in Liverpool which was I'm sure reading about it it sounded like a wonderful experience and we've just recently seen your your new blog post so um and I pointed that to students as well so for you know all the people that you've spoken to and, and the more recent ones um has there been any questions that have have made you stop and think or rethink aspects of your 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 story and and what questions i suppose have, have stood out for you i'm not quite sure i understand how to um <laughs> <that's> a lot <laughs> the people and the questions um i'm, I'm not Sorry, yeah, no, no no i'll repeat it I, it's it's great to see how you know our relationship has built up over the years yeah. and how you've you know touched so many people's lives with your with your story and more recently the the school in Liverpool and we've been reading we've just recently read your blog post about that and you know you've been asked so many questions by so many different people all over the world now I, I, we just wanted to know you know what what is there any questions that have made you stop and think or rethink aspects of your story or what okay. questions have really stood out for you yeah you know i think the question that really stands out for me is this whole issue of forgiveness because like in these questions from the students that we're talking with now um i think they were all good but um i think for me that question on forgiveness really stood out because for me that's the central the core of everything and you know it's very interesting to have that question asked in germany and it's often asked and um you know um 
the last um, Zoom call we had with the, um, Gordon Toll Synagogue, for what stands out, they weren't asking me a question so much as they were sharing from their heart. You know, yeah. what astonishes me is um, how when you, tell the truth about what happened and when you open your life in public because this is i mean think about it here we are talking about these very personal things and it's going to be all over youtube and any person uh, you know because there's so much um concern about privacy and protecting your identity but uh, opening up you know people are longing to be able to share what's really going on. And in that Gordon Tal synagogue talk, the, the community, here was a German community, and this woman and her husband interact, and she says, I just heard about what was done on Kristallnacht in our community and the Jewish people standing trembling outside their houses and their goods being thrown out. And she said, I am ashamed, I am ashamed. And, um, you know, that stands out for me. And you see that crystallizes for me that really my purpose is to share, especially uh, in these issues with Germans, that there is forgiveness, you can be free. You don't have to carry the shame of your ancestors, you know. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the big question. When people ask me about forgiveness, that really, I really engage. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to tell the students also, you know, your testimony is soon going to be in an exhibition in Golden Tall to commemorate um, the um, purchase of the synagogue, the restoration of the synagogue and, you know, how the community now is, is remembering those stories. And I suppose just before we come to that, I'd, I'd love you to just briefly tell the students about that. I don't know if, Bill, you wanted to, to jump in with any summaries or any points. Oh, well, if Hannah, if Hannah wants to speak to that, I think that would be yeah. a nice, point, a natural point at which to do it. So that would be nice. Yeah. That's OK with Although Hannah. You, you, you both, and you especially, Bill, have had a significant role in this, you know. Well, I... <laughs> really? But you have, my, my... you've translated the archive. For the students that don't know, Bill, Bill has been translating um, archival material from, from the synagogue's archive. Yes. Um... Yes, so I suppose just to, to, shall I just fill in briefly, or would Hannah, would you like to, um, um, I think it's Han Hannah, your grandfather, is that right, was was resp was one of those who was in the Jewish community in Gordon Tal and who yes. helped to, or who was amongst those who dedicated the synagogue in whenever, I can't remember the precise year now, was it 19, can anybody remember? 20, 1910, George says 1910. Yes, 1910, that's right, yeah. And um, yeah, and so uh, the story of the Jewish community in Golden Tal, where Hannah's uh, grandfather com comes from, is a story that that you know Amy and I have been coming to, coming to know. And we were just to say that Golden Tal has um, the synagogue in Golden Tal is presently a barn. It is a kind of barn. It, after the war, it, it was very badly damaged in in Kristallnacht. Uh, and then after the war, it was used for agricultural equipment to store equipment, effectively used as, as a barn, as a storage barn. Um, but in recent years, the, the community and, and also through through Hannah's story and with some support from, from Amy and, uh, and me, have uh, set about trying to buy the synagogue, first of all. And that was achieved uh, last week, a fantastic uh, moment when <laughs> the local community and the local council unanimously uh, decided to approve the purchase of the synagogue. And now there will be plans put forward to try to restore that synagogue in some way and to use it as a cultural meeting center. Uh, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. And just as when Hannah was talking about the meeting we, we had with the community, well, Hannah talked to the community in Golden Tower through Zoom uh, recently, and, and Amy and I were also there. And I was also touched by the way members of the community came forward and talked to you. And after you'd introduced yourself, 
they introduced themselves, each of them, and, and very touching stories about how they'd gone past. You know, one man said, I used to go past the synagogue and I didn't know what it was. And somebody said, I would go past it and the door was always closed. And then one day I noticed it was open. And it, it, was, a, it was just fantastic to experience how, you know, you were opening your heart to them and they were also opening their hearts to you. It was a, a very, very touching, touching moment, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and for the students as well, you know, Hannah's story has been published in autobiography. It's been used in academic work. It's now going to be hopefully um, her testimony is going to be uh, produced in this um, hopefully new exhibition that we'll be doing. It's also in the current exhibition that's there that that's traveling around Germany at the moment. And, you know, your your testimony is also available to see on, on YouTube and your audio book as well. So we talk about how testimonies developed. We've talked about that briefly last week, but more so here, but also how it's used. Testimony is used in so many different ways. And as Hannah said, you know, you're part of history. Your, your story is being told to, to so many different ages of, of students and, and the public more generally in so many, and it's, it's communicated in so many different ways and really creative ways as well. You know, the, the stuff that you're, you're doing with, um, Quellen it is is wonderful how they're putting these YouTube clips together. It's so inventive. It's wonderful. But yeah, just just to really conclude now, you know, it's the anniversary of Crystal Nut tomorrow, and you know, a day that um, you know is, is really part of your story. And I just wondered if Hannah, you wanted to to leave us with a blessing, really. We remember the past and um, we remember um, the loss of these places of worship. And we um, sorrow with um, those who sorrow, but um, today, we um, trust in the great shepherd who cares for the sheep and we um, bless Gordon Tal and we bless one another in our pursuit of truth and healing. Amen. Amen. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anna.